I am live. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Brew Writes, and you are hereby invited to write with me. Actually, I'm I'm kidding. You're you're not invited to write. You're invited to like listen to what I say, and that's pretty much it. You can't do anything else. I'm sorry. That's the way it works. You know, streamers' rules and shit. But yeah, welcome to Brew Writes. I hope you have a good time. Uh, I am here to write little. Little stories from writing prompts usually gotten from Reddit. Uh, I have tried branching out, but I haven't gotten too many great uh, writing prompts yet. And uh, what I'm going to do is hold on. Is my music playing? Music is playing. Okay, I need to stop the music. Hold on, just a second. Sorry, I have the music is for the stories. Okay, the music is not for you to enjoy randomly. It's for the stories. If I wanted to make you enjoy music randomly, I would just play music. Also, Mickey, where the hell are you? You said you commented before I started, and now you've just left me all alone. Is this how you treat your famous, your favorite non-gamer streamer, as you say it? But yeah, I think everything is ready to go, and everything should be good. We can begin. So, I have five stories for you today. A couple of things before I start. One is it's all from writing prompts, and writing prompts usually have a very specific thing given. But you do not necessarily have to follow everything that's given in the writing prompt. You can change whatever you want. You can add in your own details. You can remove a few details. You can do whatever you want. So I take a lot of uh, creative liberties aside from the writing prompt itself. And the second thing is I am uh, trying to write like different genres, trying to write different things, not just any one thing. I, I usually write fantasy stories and I want to get out of that. So I'm trying to write a little, few more realistic things. And I hope you guys enjoy it. So we can get started with the first writing prompt. I should start the music after the writing prompt. A fight between a hero and a villain, but they are both having fun and the fight becomes increasingly less serious with time. And uh, just give me one small second. Okay. Um, so we start the music here. Yes, we can start. Gigantimo and Helorio were mortal enemies. They were each other's nemesis. They were at each other's throats all the time. Or were they? Their history went way back. They joined their hero school together 10 years ago. They met at the admission disc where each person would be interviewed for the first time to see if they meet the criteria. They both were very nervous and started talking to each other as a way to comfort their fears. They became fast friends in the art they had before going in for their interviews. They met in the second round of interviews and again spent the time talking about life and powers and goals for ours. The third meeting was a bit more eventful. The interview stages were over and now it was time for practical tests. They had to compete against each other in a physical test. First is the running race. The person who could run 100 meters fastest was the winner. Gigantimo and Hilario were not good with running so it became a contest of not losing. Bolty ended up whizzing past everyone in 5 seconds anyway. Then came the boulder challenge. There were a set of boulders that had to be rolled up a hill. Jajantimo was pumped. This was easy for him. One would think Jajantimo happy. He managed to finish the challenge very quickly and smirked at Helorio as if to show off. Helorio remembered the drin and waited for revenge. Unfortunately for both of them, Earthbreaker had beaten them both ages ago. The next test was to summon a familiar. Gigantimo was useless here and failed while Helorio summoned the Hounds of Hell and made them go and playfully bite Gigantimo as revenge for the last round. Even here, the Toad Master had managed to outdo both of them. The last round had a test of casting magic. Both Gigantimo and Helorio were uselessly standing in a corner until the test was over. They failed two challenges each, but things weren't so bad for them. A lot of people had failed all the tests, let alone the people who didn't even pass the interviews. Don't be fooled though, they were still at the bottom when it came to talent. They were both very niche and couldn't hold their own in battle unless it was against one particular person. As a result of a lot of failures, they both went their own paths, with Hilario taking the path of the devil and Gigantum over the land of the giants. Both were not the socially acceptable paths that one would take, but they were accepted by law. The two met again today, failures in their own right, trying to fight it out until one victor and one failure remained. They grinned at each other. You tamed that stupid dog of yours yet? Gigantimo asked. Don't insult my hounds of hell like that, you rock throwing off. Did you really spend five years learning how to throw a stone? Hilario laughed back. Gigantimo couldn't fight his friend, neither could Hilario. I haven't cast the first stone here, but I can cast the last, Gigantimo claimed and rushed towards Hilario and dabbed him in a giant, healing hug. You're gonna kill me off! Hilario yelled and slipped away. Oof. Thank God for me being nimble. Do you go to jail for murder every time you sleep with someone? He asked. 
Why don't you get me drunk and find out? Asked Jayantimo, grinning. The two friends went out to the bar to find out exactly what a drunk and horny Jayantimo could do. Okay, music stopped. Hey, not bad. I actually managed to do it right as the music stopped this time. So um, I'm going to I'm just going to give give a small explanation of my thought thought process behind uh, the story after each story. And also, uh, this is the second time, this is the second stream in my life that I've actually tried putting music in. So if you guys think it doesn't go with it, or if it's too loud, or if it's distracting, please let me know. I will adjust it accordingly so that, you know, you guys can enjoy yourselves a bit more. But yeah, so a hero and a villain, this is a very common theme. This is a very common writing prompt, which like, you know, this is a writing prompt element, I would say, because everybody has a hero, everybody has a villain, which they want to talk about. And after a point, I'm, I just got tired of, uh, you know, thinking of unique names for some heroes and unique names for some villains. So for a story where the names didn't particularly matter because I don't really care about their names in this particular story, I just thought of uh, Jantimo and Hidorio. I was like, I want a guy who's big. I want a guy who's from hell. And that's 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 it. That's basically it. And I didn't want them to be, uh, I didn't want them to have like a serious fight because a lot of, uh, I've written a lot of fantasy stories with serious fights in them. And I wanted it to be more of a funny thing because the writing prompt anyway, talks about it being more and more fun and less serious as time goes on. So if they were heroes and villains, they, I assume there would be a hero school where they could actually learn how to do these things. And basically these two, I wanted to craft a story where they are like uh, school friends and they both are, you know, they both have had like a lot of history behind and uh, they've all done their own things. But if they were actually the top villain and top hero, then they would have to fight seriously and there wouldn't be any fun over there there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any option for fun because the hero would be expected to destroy the villain the villain would be expected to destroy the hero you know the the, the whole uh social norms for heroes and villains thing you guys get it so i wanted to make it something where they both were not really uh expected to be doing all these things so they were they were technically failures like they're good at some things like very very niche things and they're terrible at everything else and so Tajantimo, obviously, giant guy, he can uh, he can push up boulders up a hill. And of course, one would think Tajantimo happy is a uh, direct reference to Sisyphus, the, the tale of Sisyphus. And uh, where you say, what, where, uh, what's his name? I forgot his name. I forgot his goddamn name. I, I know the reference and I forgot his name. Albert Camus talks about Sisyphus and how Sisyphus would be happy with the continuous movement of pushing the boulder up the hill just for it to roll down all over again because he finds meaning in that life. So just a small little reference over there. And Helorio, Hel you know, because he's from hell, can summon the hounds of hell. And uh, I was just thinking, like, imagine if you got a hound from hell, you know, all scary, like lava all over it. And it's like, like, like foaming at the mouth, waiting to kill somebody and drag their soul to the underworld. And he's like, yo, go, go bite that guy playfully. Just give him a little nip so that he stays on his toes. <laughs> so Gigantimo just gets a little nip from a hellhound. And... They still, at the end, still fail. Even though they could do certain things, they both are failures and they don't really get any achievements in this school. And eventually they, got, they both go out into their own paths. And I chose these two because, so one is the path of the devil is considered taboo in almost any fantasy story you take in the world. Like anyone who does devil arts or evil arts and so on are considered terrible people who are going to destroy the world, blah, blah, blah. And uh, giants are always looked at in most stories as uh, not as it's not like they're uh, completely outcast, but it's more like everyone's scared of giants and they believe that giants bring about uh, destruction without any, without any stopping. So I want to want them to go their own paths according to their names as well, of course. And uh, they basically meet each other later and they're like, Hey, I'm not going to fight you. You're my friend. And because these two are failures, nobody's going to look at them and be like, what? You're a hero. I thought you would de destroy that villain. They're going to be like, ah, it's, it's this guy. Like, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he just like ran away or something. And the same for the villain. They're like, oh, it's this dude. It's Hilario. Wow. I'm so scared. Wow. Ugh. And then they both just end up being friends and uh, going out to drink. And for some reason, I made uh, Gigantimo honey. That is... Very relevant to the story. Very important, guys. You know, you need you need to have your uh, main character be horny. Otherwise, you've not written a good story. That is in the wise words of um, George R. R. Martin. I don't know. Anyway, we can move on to the next story. I'm just going to quickly change the music. And pause. 
And once I change the music, I'm just going to take a quick sip of water because my throat gets really burnt out from reading too much. So just a second. You guys can let me know anything you want, by the way. If you think I suck, you can let me know that as well. Okay. Just going to check everything real quick. Uh, nothing on Reddit, nothing on Facebook, nothing on Twitch, nothing on YouTube. Okay, cool. We can move on to the next story, which is two dying gods promise to find each other in the next life. And I'm just going to... Music, music. Ragnarok was known to be the death of the gods. Odin feared it greatly and even went to the length of chaining and binding Fenrir so that the day may never come. The prophecy said that Fenrir would start Ragnarok and Odin would die. And so would the rest of the gods. While Odin, Tyr, Freya and Thor were making their plans to combat Ragnarok, many gods knew that there would be no escaping the devastation that was to come. They made their peace with it, although some lingering feelings and regrets remain. Ragnarok didn't affect only the Norse gods, you see. It affected all gods of all cultures. There were many gods across the world and the heavens would be struck down whether they wished to or not. They wouldn't join Odin against Fenrir, but Fenrir would roam the heavens until he killed all. The lesser gods were obviously not thrilled about this prophecy, but they had no choice. Either fight with the Norse gods at the helm or die and die or enjoy their lives until death comes to embrace them. Two such lower gods were in love. They were the dual gods of love themselves, helping lovers around the world be a little happier. The way of worship for these two gods was the mutual mating of humans, which acted like an offering or a ritual for the duo. Kama and Aiko were of different cultures, technically, but they came together to make the world a place filled with more love. With such a noble goal, it was hard to not root for these gods. They didn't deserve the terrible death at the paws of a giant wolf that would tear the heavens apart, did they? Life is unfair though. They just wanted a world where they could love in peace. They did something that a lot of other gods were trying. They crafted a unique potion that required a lot of special ingredients from all around the world. Let's not talk too much about the ingredients and how they got them because bad testicles are a part of them, okay? Then they infused their blood into the potion and made an elixir that would help them achieve their goal. They drank it together and fell into a deep slumber. When they awoke, they practiced their art and enjoyed each other until the fateful day when Fenrir came to their door. They knew they stood no chance and asked for a swift death, but Fenrir was cruel and angry. He relished every moment of pain that the gods felt and he took his time ripping them to shreds, making sure that one would see the other's pain. This caused a ripple in their love and thereby the, hum the love of all humans as well. They died terrible deaths, but the elixir would save them. Their consciousness would be passed down to humans and they would forever be reborn and find each other. Unfortunately, two problems occurred. First, Aiko and Kama didn't just reincarnate as humans. Their consciousness was split amongst all humans in existence. Second, the torture Fenrir put both of them through completely broke their minds in different ways. This led to humans no longer feeling complete love and having arguments and breaking up with each other. For every broken up couple, Aiko and Kama grew more and more fragmented and every successful relationship strengthened them. While they managed to survive Ragnarok, they still had a sad fate, forever searching for their missing part. Okay, um, I realize now that the music ended way before the story, so my, my apologies for that. But I shall, uh, hopefully the next song, the next track won't end too soon. Okay, so, but just talking a little bit about the story. Uh, Firstly, I'm playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla right now, and uh, that gave me a little bit, gave me a lot of inspiration for the story. So I, I constantly talk about Ragnarok because amongst all mythology that I indulge myself in, Ragnarok is the ultimate end of everything. Like there's no other mythology which is like, okay, everything's dying, we're all dead, we, we can't do shit, okay, we're just screwed. So uh, I always reference Ragnarok in that case because, you know, that, that's when you know that the gods are really, really scared. And uh, so there is a lot of uh, Norse mythology that goes into this. Basically, Odin uh, gets a prophecy that uh, Fenrir is going to start Ragnarok and uh, Fenrir being the son of Loki, is uh, he's not going to kill Loki and he's going to kill all the gods, all the gods in Asgard, blah, 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 blah. So Odin has him chained and bound with uh, Gleipnir, the magical chain. And uh, he thinks that, okay, now that the wolf is chained up, he's never going to be able to kill me, right? Except he gets free one day and that's what causes Ragnarok to happen. And that is the explanation as to why these Norse gods don't exist right now amongst us. Or so they say. But what if Ragnarok killed every god in existence all around the world? And that's where 
it gets more interesting now you don't just have a few gods dying of one culture you have every god dying in every culture due to this giant wolf that just wants to rip everything apart and the two gods who are the, the, the writing drum said that they would find each other in the next life so the gods have to die like that, then there's no if they don't die then the writing prompt is not fulfilled at all so they have to die so i, I just thought of a convincing reason how they would die instead of just saying uh, you know they they lost their power and they died so i thought ragnarok was a pretty good explanation of why they would be dying in the first place so kama is actually an indian god of love and aiko is a japanese god of love uh, not not necessarily gods in the same sense but uh, they're supposed to be representations of love in both cultures and basically they have a mutual consent meeting which is which is basically sex so they basically enjoy sex and they uh, enjoy it when humans have sex because it's like an offering to them it's like yeah hey, you're partaking in what what i do all the time i feel empowered by that and uh, basically that their goal in life is to just spread love around the world but fenrir has different ideas he wants to destroy them completely and i also wanted to put in a couple of lines with a little bit of word play that's why i wrote they they just wanted a world where they could love in peace instead of live in peace you know just just to add a little bit of an like my like my spell checker is like hey do you mean live in peace like isn't it supposed to be live and i was like god damn it like, like i'm being clever okay i'm being smart i'm trying okay and uh, also they crafted a unique potion this is actually from uh, assassin's creed valhalla where uh, havi or odin basically creates a potion that ensures that he can uh, live on in the uh, tree of life and yggdrasil and he basically possesses somebody else down the line in the future and okay so i think we have to address the bare testicles in the room okay so the bare testicles also come from assassin's creed valhalla actually because there's a side mission where you have to make a potion that is supposed to give you wealth and uh, what happens is you have to get like uh, you have to get certain herbs and you have to kill a bear and get two bare testicles and the, uh, there's an alchemist who kind of mixes it together and you drink it why anybody would kill a bear get its testicles just to drink it i will never know but that's what you do and then uh, you you pass out and you wake up next to the skeleton which holds a treasure and the alchemist is like hey did you get did you get rich and the, and your character is just like yeah I, i stole treasure from a skeleton so i found that whole thing just really really weird i don't know if there's like some great significance behind bad testicles in norse mythology but i i felt like it had to be added to the story but basically they make an elixir that uh, helps them spread their consciousness down and uh, fenrir just is always talked about as a cruel and angry wolf that wants to destroy everything and only has rage and destruction in his mind so he literally like tortures them it gives them heavy trauma and so aiko and kama are the reason that because their consciousness gets uh, passed down and gets splintered across humanity they're the reason that humans can love each other and uh, form bonds but because of the torture that fenrir did there was so there was deep trauma which caused them to have arguments and break up and disagree with each other at certain points now uh, let me be clear there there are a lot of uh, messed up things that happen in the world in regards to relationships there are a lot of uh, very very I mean any reason to break up with someone is a good reason if if you're not happy or not happy if there's something goes wrong something goes wrong but i'm just making like a story where you know it's like this is the reason why so i'm not i'm not i'm not trying to downplay anything just trying to write a story that's it but basically they they start breaking up and there this turmoil in love because of the torture fenrir put them through and aiko and kama just grow more and more fragmented but with each successful relationship they become stronger they become closer and because because they two are separated they are forever looking for each other so they are humans are social animals because of that they are always looking for love each aiko and each kama they are trying to find each other and that's how people fall in love and get married and live happily ever after until they die in which case they become a skeleton and then i steal steal all their stuff after drinking bad testicles i hope that was a satisfactory explanation for the bad testicles honestly if you if you took nothing else from the story the message is about love just take the message about the bad testicles okay that's really important you don't want to miss out on those anyway we can move on to the next story i'm just going to have one more sip of water okay. Okay. 
and we have the third story. There are two more left after this. I'm just going to quickly find the music I had for this. It's, um, there you go. Here it is. Here it is. Just one second. Okay, the writing prompt is, everyone suspected the beautiful woman in black or the suave man in the tuxedo to be a spy, but no one expected the awkward and bumbling waiter to be the real traitor. Rhyming in the writing prompt, I appreciate it. Anyway, music. The Global Criminal Expo was held for the 10th year in a row, catching the attention of criminals all over the world. The highest figures in the world of the con would appear for sure, pursuing different things that were sold at the Expo. This would include basic criminal gear like guns, bulletproof vests, bombs, special glasses and so on. It would also feature many stolen goods like paintings, sculptures, exquisite wines and food of different kinds. There are even different gadgets that would ensure a successful criminal undertaking. Little poison needles that fit into a watch, a teapot that can pour tea like a normal teapot, but with the click of a button it would empty any liquid put inside a secret compartment, a little stun gun that was the size of a finger but could knock out an elephant, and even a ring that could be filled with the drug of your criminal choice. The expo was very secure and nobody could touch it. No terrorists would ever try to bomb the place, they were probably at the expo. The police knew exactly what was going on but no moves could be made. The people in the buildings and the team stationed around made the expo a fortress that couldn't be penetrated. Not to mention the forces of the expo themselves who are the law in the land. Criminals get into fights often but this security team would put a quick end to things as each one had the freedom to be judge, jury and executioner. The only option to infiltrate such places and find out the plans of these masterminds and drug lords was to send in spies. This was a suicide mission to the brave people who dared to infiltrate the expo. Not only did they need to be a part of the gang that would be attending, but they would also need to be selected. Or they needed to be their own gang or independent contractor who would buy their invitation or be infamous enough to be invited. Two such individuals were very, very suspicious. The man known as the Blight of Nature, a suave man in a tuxedo. No one knew who he actually was, but the rumors mentioned a man who could kill people by inflicting them with special plant-made poisons or diseases. He'd not always kill. Sometimes he'd inflict them the terrible illness that would leave lasting effects just to send a message. No one knew his face and this made him a person of suspect. The other, the woman known as the acupuncture mistress, a woman who's notorious for killing without a trace save for a tiny dot that could only be found after heavy inspection if the person knew what they were looking for. She was also infamous for seducing men and women alike, stabbing them at the height of pleasure, making it look like their hearts gave out in the middle of an intense self-love session. No one knew her true face either. Everyone was alert and looking for spies. This was almost an event at the expo. The person who caught spies would be rewarded and the entire expo would get a show of a spy being tortured and killed. It was fun! People could even bid on the next torture technique or the final death hit. A fun and engaging way to pass time, really. As everyone looked for something suspicious with these two, they were also getting annoyed at a waiter who didn't seem to know who he chose to pour, perform poorly in front of. He spilled wine on the lap of Madame Spider and slipped and fell, causing all the shrimp to fall on Al Dente, the famous mobster. He profusely apologized and tried to wipe away the mess each time but was thrown back by bodyguards. He then bow and cry, apologizing for his life. Everyone was too occupied with the spy search to see what was going on. The waiter was shouting an apology. Please take my apologies now and don't enact any action on me for my mistakes. I hope you can forgive me now. The police jumped in up to that line. Not just the local cops, but the FBI, the CIA, RAW, NSA and every other security agency on the planet sent people for this historic arrest. The waiter who was struck in fear jumped to action, dancing around the battlefield and shooting down people with grace. No signs of bumbling left. After all was done, the waiter pretended to be waitering and took a plate of shrimp to the head of the joint force to act a little cocky. He tripped, fell and spilled the shrimp on his boss. <sighs> okay. Um, music definitely lasted long enough, I would say. But yes, so this is this was the third story. And Kari Sina says, I'll just volume with louder than you. See, this is why I'm asking people to tell me, okay, I will, I will adjust the... I, I, I did reduce the music volume again, but somehow Kari still feels like it's too loud. Okay, okay. How's how's this, Kari? How's this? Let me let me know. Let me know how this is. Okay, wait, it's not it's not playing. You cursed me, you cursed me. Yes, okay, I'm just playing the music 
and I'm just going to be talking and uh, you guys can tell me if it's too loud right now I've reduced it even further uh, I think this should be good so just let me know whenever you can Corey thank you but yeah till then I'm just going to quickly talk about oh uh, this is good he says okay then I will pause the music for now good but yeah so uh, okay, to, to be very honest, the writing prompt is a little bit of a bait because everybody expects like, expects the awkward and bumbling waiter to be the actual spy, right? Nobody expects like a classy person to be a spy. They always expect like these, the waiters to be a spy. Every every movie where somebody infiltrates some place, they go as a waiter. Have you noticed that? Have you ever noticed that? And then, and yet this writing prompt writer seems to think that nobody thinks that the waiter is suspicious. Now that is, a, I'm wondering what is going on in that guy's mind. I'm, okay, I'm just kidding. Thanks for the writing prompt in case you're watching OP. But yeah, so basically, the Global Criminal Expo. We have expos for a lot of things as humans, okay? We have an expo for literally everything. But these poor criminals, you know, they're just trying to do some crime. And they don't get an expo. They don't get a place to go and and uh, exchange ways to kill people and, and uh, transport drugs and all. Come on, that's just unfair. So the Global Criminal Expo is being held each time. And of course, all the criminals go there. And of course, they get a lot of different weapons and so on. They get a lot of different gadgets. They get all kinds of art because art is very important for criminals. They are, they are extreme appreciators of art. They also like to avoid taxes. And yeah, and of course, a few fun little things, poison needles that fit into a watch. I don't know where I got that idea from, honestly. But a teapot... There's, this is actually a, a thing which apparently was used in assassinations in human history where you have a teapot and then you put poison inside this little container in the teapot and when you click one little thing, it pours in the poison instead of the tea. So you, you could just be pouring out a normal cup of tea for yourself and then pour in a normal cup of tea for your enemy and then click and they just poison, they're screwed, they're dead right there. And uh, little stun guns, I don't know how stun guns work, so please don't uh, don't... Tell me I'm wrong with the physics of that. I failed physics in school. And uh, of course, a ring that can be filled with your drug of choice. It can, it can be anything. Like I know some people who have like berserker drugs. So maybe they just have a little ring and they're like, and then they go crazy. Cocaine, is it? I don't know. But anyway, yeah, of course. And the expo is a very safe place because, you know, the top criminals of the world will make sure it's a very safe place. And no, no criminal is actually going to act against the other criminals. One. Everyone would kill them if they, if they manage to survive. And two, they probably are at the expo themselves. They, they, can't, they can't avoid all the good stuff, all the good weapons, all the good art just going away toward their, their, uh, their contemporaries. You know, it's, it's a contest. It's a, it's, a, it's a contest to see who has more wealth through crime. And of course, they, they expo then, expo themselves offer up a security service, which also puts a stop to all criminal fights. And it's a joint understanding that this, these guys are going to be policing the criminals in this one particular place. Nobody's allowed to kill each other over here. And the blight of nature is just, um, I actually just wanted him to be a blight. And a blight can be anything. It can, but mostly, uh, oh, Scully says, I know that people are pretty cool. Exactly. But yeah, the blight of nature can be anything. But a blight can is usually something that has to do with uh, some sort of mold, some sort of illnesses through mold and stuff like that. So I was like, what if this guy could just like kill people with diseases? But he, instead of doing that, it's like he just gives COVID to someone and then they have like permanent lung damage and he's just like, hey, hey, hey now you know not to mess with me. And uh, I just thought it'd be like a fun thing for a guy to do. Like I would totally do that if I had the ability to do such things. And the acupuncture mistress is of course, you know, you can kill people without them even realizing it. There's like, there'll probably be some pre pressure point right over here and just like, oh, and you're dead. And uh, I don't know why there's so much like sexual activity in my stories this time. Maybe I should have renamed it to like, rename this the stream to like sex away or depression or something. But anyway, basically she, she uh, puts people in awkward spots after their deaths because it looks like they're in the middle of an intense self-love session. And everyone looks at these two people and they're like, oh, you know what? We, we got to catch these spies because if we catch them, we get re rewards for it and we get to torture them for it. You know, if there's one thing that criminals like to do. This I learned from a very credible source called uh, movies and television shows. Criminals love to torture people and they get a lot of joy from it. So, well, of course, they would want to do that. And uh, I just wanted to choose a couple of other random criminal names. Madame Spider, 
seems very fancy, seems very deadly. And I know, I know Cory is scared of spiders here. Cory, are you scared of the... She, oh, wait, he says, or, or she can try to kill people and fix them, heal their joint pain and whatnot. Hey, why would, you, why would she want to help them? She just has to kill them and nothing else. There's no fun in helping people as a criminal. And you have Al Dente, the famous mobster. You know, I was actually thinking of Al Capone and then I was like, what Al, Al, what can I write? Al something. And then I was like, hey, I'm making pasta and the pasta is Al Dente. I was like, Ooh, this, is a good, this is a fun little name to put over there. Okay, it's cheesy, but you know, it's, it's fine. I think it's funny. Anyway, the rest of it is just like fun stuff in the end. The, the guy does a lot of cool shit and then ends up pouring shrimp out on his boss again. So, you know, everyone, everyone could be good at something and in the end, you're going to throw away a plate of shrimp on your boss and get fired afterwards. Except in this case, because you took down a criminal enterprise, you'd probably be killed afterwards. That's also something television and movies have taught me that people get killed if they do good jobs, if they, if they know too many secrets. So, yeah, let's move on to the next story. I'm just going to take another sip of water. Okay, let me load up the music for this. This is this. This is this. Okay. Sorry, man. Uh, I, I said this in the last stream as well because I'm not used to putting music in my uh, in my streams. I am I'm kind of like all over the place in terms of organization. So I just have music files that are named like sad, happy, cool, sci-fi, mysterious, and stuff like that. So I kind of have to figure out on the fly and re remember what I wanted to assign to what. So please bear with me a bit on that. Anyway, the writing prompt is: I don't like her. What? Why? She's so nice and kind. Exactly. If someone's being even a little selfish, then I know they're honest. But she's too nice, meaning she's hiding something. Start the music. Nancy was an innocent and kind person. There was no one who would say otherwise. She was loved by everyone. Well, almost everyone. Jenny was not a fan. Karen was not a fan of Jenny not being a fan. Why do you not like her? Do you know she sat next to me for six hours into the night explaining concepts so that I wouldn't fail my exam? She had no reason to. She's the nicest person I've met, Karen started. Nice people always hide things, okay? When someone seems too good to be true, it's because they're... Because they are. I said they're not. Bye-bye. Haven't you ever heard of all those Catholic priests or the problems happening in the world? Everyone thought those people were the nicest and see what they revealed, Jenny frantically said. Look, not everyone has some deep, dark secret, okay? Nancy is just plain nice. She is just filled with love and wants to make the world a better place, Karen retorted. Well, that's what they all say and then we find the dungeon of bones underneath their house. Or they turn out to be lizard people. Or they're secretly part of the Illuminati. You won't know until it's too late, she yelled. Karen sighed. This wasn't the first time she had heard such stuff from Jenny. Jenny was huge on conspiracy theories. She also suspected people when they were nice to her. I guess she wasn't used to people being nice for no reason. Jenny was still a very nice person, conspiracies aside. Karen did what she always did, ignored her and walked away. The next day, Karen was on her way to meet Jenny to go out to a football game in the campus when she saw Nancy sitting and crying near Jenny's accommodation. She asked what happened and she refused to talk. Eventually explaining that Jenny had cornered her and started accusing her of being a witch or a murderer and that she sees through her easily and will never let her take her body, blah, 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 blah. Karen was shocked and angry. She asked Nancy to wait a moment and went in and laid into Jenny and made sure she knew that if she ever pulled something like this again, she'd make sure there was no more friendship between them. She also demanded that Jenny go out and apologize profusely to Nancy. When they went out, Nancy was bawling her heart out and screaming on the floor, unable to control herself. Karen immediately helped her up and tried to calm her down. As she cried and gasped for breath, Nancy revealed her big secret that Jenny had been desperate to uncover. She had been bullied as a child, 15 years straight. They called her all kinds of things, used to kick her and push her down, used to draw bad words and drawings on her desk and spread rumors about her. Till high school, she had no friends and everyone hated her and wanted to make her life hell. After a lot of therapy and a lot of medication, Nancy finally managed to talk to people normally and made the decision to leave the state for college. She wanted a fresh start and she made sure she treated everyone as nice as she could. She didn't want anyone to feel even a bit of what she felt for most of her life. 
when Ginny screamed at her, all her trauma and hurt feelings from before came back, sending her into a panic attack. Lesson learned, Ginny. When people are nice, be nice back to them. Okay, now the music is too long. Anyway, that's the fourth story, and there's one more story left. And Kari Sena says, "Cheesy like your pasta, hey 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 hey. You know I can't make cheesy pasta at home, Kari. Why would you torture me so?" Anyway, so names aside, I don't know why I came up with these names. These names are just what came up to me. But I was uh, thinking about this, and I was uh, I just spent a few minutes thinking about why why someone would not trust someone who's being nice. And uh, I thought of the first person who I could think of who doesn't trust anyone who's nice, even when they're genuinely trying to be nice, and that is. Uh, a very fun person who's uh, commenting on YouTube, Kari Sinha, who's a good friend of mine. Who, like, if if I if I offer him if I offer him a, a, a I don't know a candy or something, he'd probably think it was poison because uh, people don't do nice things unless they get something out of it. And uh, he, Kari, you are my inspiration for this story, except with a little bit of conspiracy theories added into the mix. So basically. This person doesn't like the nice person because they're like, okay, if they're nice, they must have something to hide. And goes into the conspiracy theory straight away, like Catholic priests and the Illuminati and the lizard people and all that stuff. And of course, the, a normal person doesn't accept this kind of bullshit, and you just kind of ignore it and walk away. Except she started picking on the girl, and that made it worse for uh, Karen, who was like, like, who's like trying to be. Uh, friends with Nancy, and she starts laying into Jenny, talking her, uh, talking to her about how she could do something like this, and just blasting her and asking her to go apologize and make sure that things are okay. And the big secret that eventually happens, like why the person is so nice, is because she's been treated like shit for most of her life, and she can't stand it, and she wants a change, and she decides to do something different and make sure that she's as nice as possible to everyone else. And uh, there's there's a bit of uh, personal experience within this story because when i was in school i was bullied for a long long time until i learned to stand up for myself in the last last few months of the last year that i was there and i decided to go to a completely different place for college and i decided to be a different person i worked on myself i went to a japanese class and that's when i met kari actually and i just learned new things i learned new languages learned how to play instruments gave up on all of it because i learned i sucked at languages and instruments but i still tried and i went to college and my life became a lot better i got some better friends not the best but i got some better friends and i grew into a better person and eventually i could get past all the bullying and all the shit that happened in school and managed to live a better life i mean i'm not saying that the depression still isn't there that it definitely is but that's hence the stream but the bullying at least i don't care about anymore so this is something where i this is something i faced as well that i'm like nice to people because i can see signs of uh, bullying or like even like demeaning and all that stuff so i try to be nicer to people who are facing stuff like that and a lot of people are just like why are you being nice to that person that's so weird why are you being so nice it just seems fake and i'm like no i'm just genuinely trying to be nice i don't want them to face what i face so i'm trying to make them feel a little better so this might be like a very preachy type of thing, but uh, guys, you know, you never know what anyone's going through. So if they're being, if you think someone's being fake nice, maybe they are just trying to genuinely be nice and you're not able to see it because you don't like them or something like that. But either way, people like Kari exist. Ain't that right, Kari? You've been awfully silent for this entire story. I'm, I think he left. I, th I can see that he's still watching, but I think he left. Okay, guys, the story has officially ended my friendship with Cory. No, oh, no, he says no, he's here. Okay, friendship's still on, don't worry. One more sip of water, then we can go to the last story. My country betrayed me, what does that even mean? Also, guys, if anyone's looking at Corey's comments on YouTube, don't believe him because he used to be bullied until he broke a chair over a guy's head. Like he literally he took a chair and then he broke it over his bully's head. Bully got sent to the hospital, had to get brain surgery and shit. Okay, I'm 
exaggerating it way too much. But basically, he he ended up bullying the bullies, so to speak. Oh, here he is. Everybody here wants to fool you. That's why I have trust issues. That's my inspiration for the story. Anyway, the last one. You've spent your life traveling the world and been to every country on earth. Everywhere you go, though, there's one weird guy you notice hanging in the background for a second. On your deathbed, you finally talk to him. I forgot to get the music ready. Sorry. Music. 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 Uh, sorry, I just lost the file here. There you go. Cool. Let's start. My first near-death experience was in the Grand Canyon. This story might not be for the light-hearted ones. I'm writing this as I lay in bed. I, I lay in a bed I chose for my last sight. A bed next to a window that you can clearly see Mount Fuji from. From all my travels, Japan was the place I wanted to die. I want my body to be cast in Fuji itself. Back to it. My first near-death experience. I was visiting the Grand Canyon and I was speaking a little too much over the edge. I almost fell over until someone grabbed me. I couldn't see who it was. Just a shadow that resembled a person. I thought nothing of it. It was my own stupidity and somebody saved me. I had to be more careful. I loved traveling and didn't want to die before seeing everything. My next near-death experience was in China. The Great Wall was before me. I was amazed by the sight and walked blindly forward as a car almost hit me. I felt a yank and fell backwards as the driver yelled at me in Chinese. Again, a shadow. I wasn't able to make out who this was. I just did something stupid again. I can't believe I was saved by another random person. I couldn't even thank them. My third near-death experience was in India. I was standing in a rural part of Nanital, a city carved into a mountain with a lake at the center. I was suddenly pulled back. What? I didn't even do anything this time, I swear! I saw a bull run past me and I would have been stabbed and run over and dead. Again, shadow. Now, it can't be a coincidence. It had to be the same person. My fourth near that experience was in Thailand. I was in the wilderness and found a mushroom that looked a lot like a shiitake mushroom. I was about to grab it when a shadow appeared and the mushroom disappeared. It was then I realized somebody was playing a hand in my life and something bad was going to happen. I saw the plucked mushroom stem and dripped a liquid that killed everything underneath it. I was extra careful from then on. Always vigilant. Always alert. I didn't eat anything that wasn't prepared by a chef. I made sure there were no accidents that would kill me. I wore a helmet when I went out, even if I was walking, and I wore padded clothes to protect me from small falls. I never went to the edge of a cliff or a building again. I still saw the same shadow in the corner of my eye every time I was in a situation that was even remotely dangerous. It would become my signal that I had to leave. Like the time I was getting it on with this woman in her room and I saw the shadow, left immediately. Turns out she was a serial killer. I found out months later when she got caught. Finally, as I lay on my deathbed, the shadow came up to me and showed itself. It was a young woman who was wearing weird clothes and seemed to have a lot of gadgets on herself. She kept looking into a mirror-like object. You must be my guardian angel, I smiled and said. Shut the fuck up, she spat back. I followed you around for your entire life, waiting to kill you and couldn't. I hope you suffer before you die now. What? I asked. She literally saved me from death so many times. Why not just let me die? There were so many options, I gasped. You think I didn't want to? Every time you died accidentally, you set off the chain of events that will kill my family a century later. I thought killing you would remove the monstrosities you committed against humanity, but I had to end up saving you. Each time you died, someone else took your place, she rambled. Why are you showing yourself to me now? I asked, scared. I'm showing myself because finally, I can see a future where my family isn't slaughtered. A future where humanity isn't crippled by one man who had a sense of grandiose and wanted to rule the world with his company. I see it now. I can kill you, finally, but I need to do it again and again until I get the right future. Or my entire life would be spent in vain following the most hated man in history, she said, her words filled with venom and anger. I did have a company that was getting bigger slowly over time, but I never imagined it would try to rule the world. I had not even thought of such plans. Why would I become the most hated man in history? So many questions haunt me. I write this after so many near-death experiences and after many deaths. The shadow girl has killed me five times already, but I come back to life, still on my deathbed, and she always comes at night with a new method to kill me. Apparently, we're caught in a mini time loop. It'll only end once I die the right way. I wish I could say I gave myself up for the future of humanity, but all I was was a traveler being tortured to death repeatedly. My name is Jess Bezos, and I hope this letter will reach humanity and justice will be sought in my name. Okay, little on the nose there with that one. Quite on the nose there with that one. But 
Kali uh, says, I like this one. Best story of the night. Thank you. But yeah, basically, uh, I don't know much about the world. I'm not a traveler. I never left the country. I was born in India. And uh, Kali has, which I, th I think that's why he liked it, because it's a traveling story. But either way, uh, so Kali and I are big fans of Japan, and we've talked a lot about this. And he really loves Mount Fuji and he's always wanted to die in Japan because he's like that, that impressed with the country. And I was like, you know what, if I die in Japan, okay, if I die in Japan, I want someone to take my body, walk up to Fuji and just throw it in. And I want my body to be the reason Fuji explodes after like ages because, you know, I don't know, my body acts as a catalyst to bring the dormant volcano and make it active and destroy all of Japan. And Kari's always cursed me ever since. So I just wanted to add that in there. But either way, I, I saw a couple of the stories that uh, people wrote about this. And Kali says, ah, you're a weave, not me. Yes, I'm a weave, you're an otaku. Cool, that works. <laughs> I saw a few stories that people wrote uh, with this writing prompt. And it was all about, like, uh, you know, people, like, trying to unravel the mystery of who the person was. And there's another story where uh, it was, it was like a person who was uh, looking out for them and helping them out through their life, making sure that they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't like suffer or die or something like that. And I was like, yeah, I would, I mean, I, I thought of that as well, but then I was like, since these guys have already written it, I don't want to write the same story except in my own style. So I thought of a new idea entirely, which was time travel. And I was like, okay, so each place that this person goes to, there is some danger, which they are saved from. And uh, I was like, Grand Canyon, you're going to fall over. Okay, we can do that. And then China, you know, you can get hit by a car or a bus or something, can do that. And uh, India, I was like, I was actually, I actually went to Nainital. Nainital is a beautiful place. It's one of the places I've actually visited. That's why I wrote even a little bit of a description for it, which is, it's a, basically a city in a mountain with a cave right at the center. And uh, there are a lot of uh, wild animals there. And that's, that's in India in general, bulls, cows, everything. And uh, as a kid, uh, my mom was like carrying me uh, and I was looking behind her shoulder and I very clearly remember like a cow coming and knocking her over and thereby knocking me as well. And it's uh, this thing which I don't remember anything before or after that. I just remember the sight of the cow coming. And my mom uh, has like, my mom you told me the story much later in life. I was like, wait a second. I thought that was a dream. I was actually hit by a cow. So uh, I had that part in there. And uh, after I was looking at mushrooms and there were a lot of uh, different mushrooms that can kill you. And uh, I, Kali's told me a lot about this as well. But basically, there's no mushroom as far as I know that can like kill you and then show signs that it's actually killing you. So I made up the little liquid that kills everything part of it. <laughs> but anyway, then I want to add a little bit of humor where, you know, you imagine, imagine you're, you know that you're a very careless person. You're going to die in some way and somebody's looking out for you. So this, uh, this person's like wearing a helmet, even if they're walking around town and this was just to make sure they get no head injuries, wearing padded clothes to make sure that if they fall, their arms aren't going to hurt or the legs aren't going to hurt or they aren't going to get stabbed straight up because of a pencil or something and all that stuff. And you basically do all this and it, it Use, this person uses the shadow as a warning sign. And uh, when they meet this woman in her house, when he, when he meets this woman in her house, he's like, okay, I see the shadow. This woman's bad news. And then it turns out she's a serial killer, gets caught later. And how he left without her killing him, either way, I will not know. But he left, okay? He's, uh, so he's a strong boy. He manages to leave. And in the end, at the deathbed, the woman shows up and he's like, ah, you're the one who's been saving me. You're my guardian angel. And she's just like pissed. And... This is the plot twist that nobody expected, which is that the, the guardian angel wanted to kill him all along, but it wasn't, the time wasn't right. And she literally had to, she has this mirror-like object. I just put a small little reference to it, but uh, it's just something like which he kept looking into a mirror-like object. So basically that helps her see her timeline, helps her see her future, basically. With each action that she decides to take, she looks at the thing and she sees, okay, it's going to change like this. Okay, let me do this instead. So she wants to kill him, but then she looks at it and she's like, shit, everything is still in ruins. So she goes and saves him instead. And she's like, okay, now things are getting back to normal. Okay, things are getting better. So she uses that as like a way to decide what to do next. I didn't want to go into depth about it because the story was already getting long. So I just thought I'd explain it when I was uh, saying this out. And basically, it's a person who has... So another thing is like, I got the idea for this time travel thing from a writing prompt very long ago, which involved Hitler. And uh, I did not partake in that. I, I just read what 
other people wrote, but it was basically a lot about it. The writing prompt was something like, okay, you go back in time and you try to stop Hitler. And there's another one which said you go back in time and kill Hitler. And then it turns out the future was worse than it is now. So people had written a lot of uh, things there and I took a little bit of uh, inspiration from that, which is that this person starts a company and completely destroys the world, completely destroys humanity, is considered the worst man in history. And while writing it, I was like, okay, you know what? I think I'm going a little overboard with this. Like, who would even be that hated? And then I'm, I'm just going through, I'm looking at random things. I'm looking at random articles and stuff. So just to like, take a break from writing. And I see so many articles just about Jeff Bezos and about how Amazon is like the worst place to work in and how it's like destroying the world and how this is happening. And that, that. I was like, God damn it. This is exactly what I need for the story. So basically, this is Jeff Bezos. If... Uh, if he actually did have a person from the future guiding him, he doesn't he doesn't focus completely on Amazon. He focuses on traveling the world. And in the end, when he dies, he realizes that his death has to be done the correct way and will then save the world from Amazon, making sure that Okay, look, I don't know. I don't really like Amazon, but I don't I don't really know why I decided to write Jeff Bezos into such a terrible situation. If you like him, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry he's in this situation in this fictional story. If you don't like him, I'm, that's good. I wrote it for you. I wrote it for you guys who don't, the guys who don't like Jeff Bezos. But yeah, so basically, this is uh, Jeff Bezos' alternate universe life. And he, he just dies terrible deaths. Hey, it's card sapphic and sexy. Hello. All right. I just had to quickly set up my sound. I can hear you now. Oh, dude. Hello. Hello. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, uh, I didn't see Twitch. I was just explaining the story right now. We're a little late though, because I'm literally just getting done right now. But, uh, glad to have you here. Glad to have you back. But anyway, before I end a couple of, uh, small things that I always say at the end of the uh, end of every stream, which is, uh, I'm, not using depression as like a clickbait type of thing for you to for you to watch the stream. I actually suffer from depression, and it's just that I for the last couple of years I've been doing nothing in life, and I've been been sitting, wasting away, and doing absolutely nothing. And Kari has been convincing me to do something, like just keep writing, just keep doing something related to video, so that I can keep my skills up, so that I can keep my brain active, and I don't just stare at the wall or Reddit the whole day. So I decided to do the stream, which is a way for me to keep myself accountable which is like, just went to Twitch. Kari actually helped me make, make the designs for all this. I went to Twitch. I just put the schedule. I was like, every Tuesday, every Friday, one hour, I just have to do it. And that helps me, like, it just helps me hold myself accountable. It just helps me get through it and actually manage to, uh, you know, do something instead of just sitting demotivated the whole time. So thank you all for joining. Uh, not Nobody commented on Reddit today, but thank you. Oh, I raided you. Yeah, I saw. Thank you for the raid. I don't, I can't see anyone else though, but yeah, I'm very glad for that you're here. Scott Savick and Sexy, always appreciate you. And Corey, thanks for coming by. Yes, Encore, Encore. Yeah, I can't do Encore, Encore. My throat is dead. But I shall be back on Friday in three days. And at the, at the same time, it's going to be 10 o'clock for me in IST. So whatever, just take one hour behind on Friday. And if you do want to, if you want to see any of the other stories, you can come to my YouTube. It's Blue Rights. I upload all the stories individually. So I have like sub six episodes of stories up there now. And uh, I'm also on TikTok and Instagram, but I haven't posted anything there yet because I'm still trying to figure out how to clip it and what kind of content to put out. <sighs> but you can find me on YouTube for now if you want to see more stories. Or if you're on Reddit, you can just go to my profile and see all my stories on writing prompts. And yeah, that's it. Thank you all for joining. I appreciate it. See you all in three days. Bye-bye.